So what we call modern atomic theory is the idea that all matter is composed of atoms. And you know, most people growing up and learning anything about science, you're like, well, of course it is. But you know, this is not something that has always been known. This theory grew out of observations and laws, specifically um, three laws, the law of conservation of mass, the law of definite proportions, and the law of multiple proportions. Um, having a mind f brain fart, if you will. We talked about the scientific method in chapter one, correct? So I've taught this class multiple times, and then sometimes I have multiple sections, and I'm like, oh yeah, I told them about that, and then I didn't. So just weird experience there. So these are laws. Remember the difference between a law and a theory? The theory explains why something happens, and the law just says what happens. So three laws led to this explanation of why they work. So let's talk about those. Law of conservation of mass. Briefly stated, in a chemical reaction, matter is neither created nor destroyed. So this is what Antoine Lavoisier came up with when he was burning stuff in closed containers um, back in 1789. So when a chemical reaction occurs, the total mass of substances involved in the reaction doesn't change. This is consistent with atomic theory. Atomic theory explains this and says, well, the mass doesn't change because in a chemical reaction, all we're doing is we are rearranging the atoms. All the atoms that were there at the beginning are still there at the end. We're just putting them together in different combinations like taking a Lego house and rebuilding it to form two little cottages or something, right? All the Lego bricks are still there. None have been created or destroyed. The individual particles are indestructible. Any questions about that? So, visual example here. If we take some sodium, represented as the uh, purple spheres here, and some chlorine gas, represented in the green here, and we cause a chemical reaction to occur, these will form sodium chloride, table salt, where we have alternating green and red spheres. If we weigh this and find that we start with 7.7 .7 grams of sodium and 11.9 grams of chlorine, the total mass of the reactants there is 19.6 grams. When these undergo the chemical reaction and form sodium chloride, table salt, we end up with 19.6 grams of the table salt. The matter is conserved, the mass. No mass has been gained, no mass has been destroyed. Because all we're doing is we're taking these spheres and these spheres, and we're just combining them in different ways. So atoms are spherical Lego, bro Lego blocks, basically. Another law that led to atomic theory is the law of definite proportions. This is also back in the 1700s. Um, French chemist Joseph Proust made observations about the composition of compounds. So he summarized his observations as all the samples of a given compound, regardless of their source or how they were prepared, have the same proportions of their constituent elements. Now sometimes when you you say these laws in a concise way, it doesn't necessarily make a whole lot of sense. And so sometimes we need to sort of explain the law. So as an example here, if you take 18 grams of water and you decompose it, so water is composed of hydrogen and oxygen, decompose it, you'll get 16 grams of oxygen and 2 grams of hydrogen. So he's talking about the same proportions of their constituent elements. So when we destroy water or decompose water, we have a mass of the elements, 16 grams to two grams. We could simplify that eight or eight to one. So the mass of oxygen and the mass of hydrogen is eight to one in water. It doesn't matter where you get the water from. It doesn't matter how you decompose it. You can take that um, those elements and form them into water, 
the ratio is always the same. That's a definite proportion. It's the same ratio. So let's apply that. Two samples of carbon monoxide are decomposed into their constituent elements. One sample produces 12, uh, sorry, 17.2 grams of oxygen and 12.9 grams of carbon. The other produces 10.5 grams of oxygen and 7.88 grams of carbon. Random numbers. Show that these results are consistent with the law of definite proportions. So it says that these are two samples of carbon monoxide. They're supposedly two samples of the same compound. The law of definite proportions says the ratio of the mass of oxygen to carbon should be the same for both samples. Now, we can't just look at these numbers. I can't do that math in my head. So we have to actually get out our calculators and do some dividing here. So let's look at sample one. So sample one, um, 17.2 grams of oxygen and 12.9 grams of carbon. 17.2 divided by 12.9. Um, my calculator says 1.3333333. So that is equivalent to a fraction of uh, one and a third, four thirds, four to three. Let me double check that. Yeah. So four thirds. Okay. Law of definite proportion says this other sample should also give a ratio of four to three. So let's check that one. Sample two. We have 10.5 grams of oxygen and 7.88 grams of carbon. We take 10.5 and divide by 7.88. And my calculator is giving me 1.33 and some other digits, but essentially the same as 4 thirds. Any questions? There's a couple questions on a worksheet that we're doing next week that are gonna ask you about the law of definite proportions. And this is one of those things, we do so many things in chemistry that are, are hard and complicated, and this one is so simple that it becomes hard. You just take the masses of the elements and find the ratios, okay? So that was definite proportions, the same proportions, and then we have the law of multiple proportions, which seems to contradict that, but it's just um, in addition to. So 1804, John Dalton again, law of multiple proportions. Um, when two elements, and we'll just call them A and B, form two different compounds, the masses of element B that combine with one gram of element A can be expressed as a ratio of small whole numbers. Okay, what the heck does that mean? So we just saw with the two samples of carbon monoxide that the ratio of the elements for each sample was the same, right? Because they were the same compound. If we take a different compound that has the same elements in it, we could also find the ratio of carbon to oxygen for that one, right? Or oxygen to carbon, I forget which one it was. What this is saying is that if you take the ratio of those ratios, you'll get a small whole number. I know, that's a lot to digest at 8.30 in the morning. The reason this happens is because matter is composed of individual particles. So you could have one atom of A combining with one atom of B, so you could have A with one B, you could have a, an atom of A combining with two atoms of B, or an atom of A combining with three atoms of B, or you could have like two atoms of A and one atom of B. 
it comes down to ratios of atoms. And if you take the masses of them and divide them, you'll get a whole number. So let's look at an example. So carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. Two compounds composed from the same two elements, carbon and oxygen. Um, the mass ratio of oxygen to carbon in carbon dioxide is 2.67 to 1. And in carbon monoxide, as we saw in our previous example, it's 1.33 to 1. So what the law of multiple proportions says is if we take the ratio of these two ratios, we'll get a small whole number. So 2.67 divided by 1.33. My calculator says 2.00751897. Well, that doesn't look like a whole number. Actual measurements have uncertainty, and this is one of the reasons why we need to understand significant figures. If we follow significant figure rules here, this has three sig figs and this has three sig figs, and we're dividing, so the answer should have three significant figures. So let's round it correctly. We're going to keep one, two, three digits. We look at the next digit, 7, so we need to round up, and so this is 2.01. And you could say, well, is this okay? That's still not a whole number. But it is a ratio. It has uncertainty in it, and where is the uncertainty? In the last digit. So the fact that this is a little bit off in this last uncertain digit doesn't bother me at all. Okay, because it comes from real measurements. We could also do this looking at using the fractions, um, and then it'll come out more nicely. So we saw that um, 1.33 is 4 thirds. What's 2.67? Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. 2.67 times 3, um, that's 8, 8 thirds. So 2.67 as a fraction is 8 thirds. So if we take 8 thirds and divide it by 4 thirds, what do we get? 2. So this is what the law of multiple proportion says. If you look at the ratio of the two elements in one compound and the two, same two elements in a different compound, and you take the ratio of the ratios, you'll get a small whole number. Any questions? I'm guessing that was as clear as mud. Yes? That's a good question. How am I getting the eight over three? from 2.67. Um, I recognize that 66666 is um, two thirds. So I took 2.67 and multiplied by three, um, and that gave me eight. And you can do it on your calculator, eight divided by three will give you 2.67. So it's the fraction equivalent of the decimal form. Good question. Anybody else? I did it both ways because personally I just prefer to deal with the numbers and put them in my calculator. Um, but some of you, you know, are good with fractions and that makes more sense to you. Because this looks more like a ratio and a ratio and a ratio of the ratios. There's also a question or two on that worksheet that makes you do this. Another example, well I guess this is the same example just written out. Uh, carbon monoxide, uh, sorry, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide. So this one has one black and two reds. This has one black and one red. The black and the red spheres, atoms, have different masses, but all the red ones have the same mass and all the black ones have the same mass. 
And so when we take the ratio of this and the ratio for that and divide them, we get two because this one has twice as many oxygens as that one. Um, hydrogen and oxygen both form water. I'm sorry, they form both water and hydrogen peroxide. The decomposition of a sample of water forms 0.125 grams of hydrogen for every one gram of oxygen. The decomposition of hydrogen peroxide forms 0.250 grams of hydrogen to every one gram of oxygen. So they've already given us the ratio of the masses. Show that these results are consistent with the law of multiple proportions. So here's the, um, the carbon monoxide. And that was uh, 0.125 grams of hydrogen for every one gram of oxygen. And for the carbon dioxide, it says we have 0 0.250 grams of hydrogen for every one gram of oxygen. How do we show that this demonstrates or supports the law of multiple proportions? I've got two ratios. What do I do with them? Divide them. I need the ratio of these two ratios. It's supposed to be a small whole number. Well, if I want it to be a whole number, I should take the biggest one and divide it by the smallest, right? So I'm gonna take this 0 0.250, it's 0 0.250 to one. I'm just gonna leave the one out because that doesn't matter. 0.250 to one divided by 0.125 to one. And that's going to give me two. In water, we have two hydrogens and one oxygen. In hydrogen peroxide, we have two hydrogens and two oxygens. This ratio is two because one of them has twice as many oxygens as the other one. Any questions? Pardon me? I'm sorry, I can't quite hear you over the fan. Um, if you want to go over on this one, you go back and see on the one. Yes. Okay. Yeah. These videos will be on, um, on YouTube. You can watch them at your leisure. And all of these um, PowerPoint slides are on Canvas so that you don't have to feel like you have to copy down every single word. Right. Okay, so modern atom atomic theory, also known as Dalton's atomic theory, explains those three laws as follows. Four points here. Um, and I'm not going to say, give the four points of Dalton's atomic theory. But we need to be familiar with these concepts more than just spitting them back if I ask you to write them down. Uh, the first idea, each element is composed of tiny indestructible particles called atoms. All atoms of a given element have the same mass and other properties that distinguish them from the atoms of other elements. Atoms combine in simple whole number ratios to form compounds. Atoms of one element cannot change into atoms of another element. In a chemical reaction, atoms only change the way that they are bound together with other atoms. Now, this was Dalton's original atomic theory and then some scientific discoveries um, caused some modifications because you take a theory and you test it with experiments and you confirm it or you disprove it um, or sometimes when the, you see a contradiction you say well we don't need to throw out the whole theory we just need to adjust part of it so there were some adjustments to this but this is the original theory any questions <coughs> 